I'm John Turner, uh, visiting the Valbank Nino Gallery in Auckland uh, in February 2020, uh, visiting from Beijing, China, where I've lived for the last seven years. And uh, this is the uh, first uh, exhibition I've had uh, in New Zealand for quite a while. And my work was included in Atham McCready's show, uh, The New Photography, work from the 60s and 70s that uh, to Papa put on recently, but this is the first show I've had in a gallery, art gallery, uh, dealer gallery, uh, for, for many, many years. And uh, it consists of um, work chosen by uh, the director, Simon Bowbank and Andrew Clark, who um, went through my vintage prints, they were particularly interested in the vintage prints, silver prints, went through my prints at uh, my lockup in Henderson, and made a, a broad choice and then honed it down. And so the exhibition consists of a six, selection of my own photographs, uh, early work. The earliest one on show is from 1963, and the most recent one I think is about 1979, you know, quite late. So it's, a, it's kind of a, like a, a, a slice in the middle of my career, you know, because I've been photographing for 60 years, so there's none of the really early work and there's none of the later work, which includes the last 15, 20 years colour work. Um, so uh, it's, it's been, um, for me, quite, quite insightful to actually see how other people see my work, and I was really impressed by um, uh, Andrew Clark, who, who put up the work, he, he um, displayed the work, the, he and Simon's selection of the work and how they sequenced it was quite different from how I would do it, but that's a, a huge benefit to me because I can see, start to see the work through other people's eyes. Well, the, the first picture in the show is actually one I made in uh, 1967 or 68 of a cherry tree in the backyard of my parents' place in Lower Hutt. And I included it in an exhibition called Looking and Seeing, which John Ritson, the education officer of the National Art Gallery then, and myself organised with about 20-odd uh, photographers. We had, you know, Teo Schoon, uh, John Johns, um, Bill Main, uh, or, you know, you know a, a, an interesting group of photographers who all were photographing something to do with nature and linked to conservation. And uh, that show, after it showed at the, in the education section at the Art Gallery, National Art Gallery, it wasn't good enough to show on the real one, the big gallery, um, it toured the country with, and got quite a lot of interest. And um, what was kind of funny about it, realising it now, was that the photograph itself is a close-up of the cherry tree, but that, at that time I, I saw how kind of sensual it was and it looked a bit like a female torso. And so in order to stress that, I turned the picture upside down. So you've got this little twig or branch, you know, looking like a nipple on here. There's the female sex organs. <laughs> so, uh, and the funny thing was that compared to some of the censorship going on today, then it went to, I don't know, about eight or more venues around the country and different art galleries and libraries. There was no, not a peep of criticism or controversy or anything. But today, um, you know, I, what was interesting was that a group of, uh, a collective, the uh, Stisbury group, they come in and they buy and share photographs. And this was the picture that they decided on, much to my surprise. <laughs> but straight away they saw what I was doing. But it seems like quite likely when it was first exhibited, most of the audience, it was in the show called Looking and Seeing, you know, so the emphasis was on the, the difference between that to really see. And uh, it looks like probably nobody picked up on what it was. <laughs> and, and as Andrew Clark mentioned in, in the Bowbank Nino intro, there's, there's a link here to Edward Weston too. And it's probably the poor man's Edward Weston if you photograph a tree that looks like a naked woman. This is one of my favourite photographs and it kind of shows you where I'm coming from and the influences because one of my exhibitions, I think the earliest one I did with Bill Main's Exposure Gallery in Wellington years and years ago in the 80s, early, mid 80s, um, was called Under the Influence, you know, because I'm happy to acknowledge all the different influences that have affected me. And so 
under the influence of people like Eugene Atche, Walker Evans, Ansel Adams, uh, Edward Weston, uh, and so on, people who photographed vernacular subject matter and the Farm Security Administration photographers, I decided that I'd photograph Johnsonville, which is where I, li I lived in Paparangi, which was a new suburb just along the road here from the main street in Johnsonville. And um, I saw it as quite a ugly, you know, I, I'm quite anti-advertising often, and I saw it as quite an ugly, tacky kind of main street, you know, with all the advertising hoardings and um, and also there's a personal connection because across the road from here, uh, that was the, uh, the, there was a house where I lived for the sort of first five years of my life before we moved to Lower Hutt. And uh, anyway, so this is John Turner's Crispus, New Zealand Crispus, which you know I'm critical of. So you have silly things like you know, there's a butcher shop and they've got pictures of Santa Claus and you know the holly and all the rest of it. But in particular, I was my, my kind of criticism was to do with every day. I'd go past this building on the way home every work day and I'd see this ugly Jansen poster which had deteriorated and was you know like a anti uh, anti advertisement you know sure as hell didn't encourage people to buy swimsuits I would think but particularly for me I, I always thought it was so ironic and stupid that the sign which was actually quite a handsome sign um, showed this poor woman every day diving, never learning, diving onto the top of the building and scraping her breasts. <laughs> and that was, that was what I saw. And to me it was just ludicrous. So um, I, I had a, at that stage I'd bought a little uh, Linhoff 5 before camera and I was in the middle of, well actually at the beginning of learning Ansel Adams own system. Um, you know, so I was both trying out my new techniques and trying to capture uh, Johnsonville. There are two other Johnsonville images in this show, but currently right now at the new library in Johnsonville there's an exhibition of about 50 pictures, 50 years old now, that uh, of Johnsonville that uh, James uh, Gilbert from the, photogra the uh, photo space gallery in Wellington organised. Um, this, which is one of my most important photographs for me personally, but it's also seems to register with a lot of other people. It's a portrait of my adopted parents, Mal and Frida Turner. Dad was a um, fitter and turner in the railway workshops in Petone, or in Lower Hutt rather, and we lived in Lower Hutt just behind the wife of Lou Marai. But um, for quite a few, a few years I tried to get a truthful portrait of my mother, who didn't like being photographed, and uh, I never succeeded with 35 mil. And so, fortunately, the photographers I show from the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the John Tchaikovsky show, came to New Zealand in Wellington in 1967, I think it was, or 68, 68 perhaps. And in that show, they had you know, original works by Walker Evans, Eugene Atche, Dorothea Lang, Edward Weston, and, and some of the Farm Security Administration people who photographed during the 30s depression in the USA and from that and also 19th century works I was inspired to say oh that's it that's the way to do it okay I'll try a formal portrait you know I didn't want a studio like portrait and that wasn't my interest because often they're, they're um, made to flatter I wasn't interested in flattering them I just wanted to kind of capture what they look like and so I, I um, set up my little Linhoff 5 before camera and photographed them on the garden seat in the back of our home in Lower Hutt. And, uh, you know, it's been one of the most... Uh, I'm just so glad I did it because I see a lot of photographers, uh, you know, I ask them, have you got any, have you got any uh, successful pictures that you really like of your loved one? It could be your partner, your parents, your aunties and uncles and so on. But too often the answer is no, they haven't. <laughs> you know, they've, Oh, so I forgot that, you know, I've been photographing volcanoes and doing this and doing that, but I forgot to photograph my parents. So that's the significance of that. And this led to me deciding I'd do a whole sequence, a series of work on the family house in Lower Hutt. For, for a long time now I've admired historical photographs, you know, from the 19th century and so on, and just studying them and there's so much, so much information and the pictures give you insights into their, into the 
the world that they lived in that don't always come across in the writing, you know, the newspaper reports and the diaries, etc., etc. So, um, for me, a lot of the work I do is based on the notion of making these pictures for posterity. You know, it's not, they're not made, they're not made for a contemporary audience because often the contemporary audience don't understand the work. You know, like it's harder for us to understand the kind of meaning of what's going on in our own life right now than it is 10 years later when you can reflect on it and think, oh, this was, this was going on, but I didn't understand that. So for me, I've often worked in, in a serial form. And so I decided I'd document my working class family's home. And so, I, for instance, I, I don't know of anybody else who's done this. I haven't seen one in New Zealand. I have, um, but I photographed the, um, the safe, the, the, the shelves. We have Pre, we didn't have a refrigerator, we couldn't afford one in the early days. Uh, and we, uh, we didn't have a television at all late either. But anyway, this is, for those who, young people who wouldn't know, this is the, how food was kept a little bit cool in pre, the pre-refrigerator day. So behind this cupboard here is a, a grill to keep out the insects. But basically there's a draft of wind coming up from underneath the house coming through this and that just keeps the meat and stuff from going rotten too early. So that's, that's what that's all about. And things like, Dad was a, a beer drinker and whatnot, but Mum's, the only kind of uh, alcohol that she'd drink was this little cocktail liqueur, you know, sweet cocktail liqueur. And so it's, it's quite a lot of, you know, information about the, the family habits and, and likes and dislikes in here. You've got the, you know, the, um, cur the uh, gravy, gravy thing. You've got uh, somewhere here. There's oh yeah, mint, mint sauce that goes on the roast. <laughs> and of course, this connects a lot of people of our my generation because this is, especially working class people, this was what their life was like. So so that that was the purpose was to kind of encapsulate you know make a kind of a slice of life of a typical working class home in Lower Hutt in the 1960s, late 1960s. I, I grew up in a house with no art. My parents weren't interested in art at all. My father uh, read cowboy books and uh, cricket and rugby books because he was, a, he was actually a Wellington representative in both of those sports and you know, pretty good sportsman. And uh, so this, this cushion is like one of the art kind of artifacts from the only ones from the family and, and it was made by my son by my mother and so this is kind of her art expression and the other expression of art in the house was the shadow box image which is just ordinary and ugly and you know little knickknacks that were probably gifted or occasionally purchased or whatever and that was their idea of art and they never encouraged me in photography. They, they didn't understand what I was trying to do with it. So, um, and also I got into trouble because I had to use the bathroom or the washroom or the bedroom as my dark room in the early days and ended up staining, you know, staining the bath and so on. But um, anyway, that, that was my art training. That was my art background, which didn't exist really, non-existent one. Uh, my brother Ross, my older brother, who's a couple of years older than me, he was also adopted but from a different family. Um, he was a hunting and fishing outdoors guy. And, you know, I learned about rabbit shooting and stuff like that when I was younger, but became more interested in photography and arts. But this is the a photograph of the, the bedroom that he and I shared for, you know, most of our, well, most of our life, uh, about 20 odd years or so. And, um, you can see, you know, see his rabbit and the the uh, pelts on the wall. The photos of him holding up his his um, trophies and so on. So um, you can see it. he was he was into the art of shooting, not not, not photography. Early on in the 1960s, 1969, 70s seemed to be kind of watershed years. You know, I had so many things. I was organising shows and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I um, w was aware of some pretty high quality 19th century 
contact punch, you know, large format contact punch. And of course I was, uh, like many, influenced by Edward Weston through the Nancy Newhall Day books of Edward Weston and so on. And I was following his work and uh, I, I thought, well this is, uh, we, we just don't see, you know, we see publications, reproductions of Weston and other famous photographers, but we don't see their prints. And he's famed, you know, like Ansel Adams, you know, for super high quality, you know, making a picture which doesn't look like a picture, it looks like you're looking at the thing itself, you know, whether it's a pepper or a skin or whatever. And so I decided, okay, I'll, I'll buy, I found out that Cole Weston, his son, because Weston, Edward died in 1958, Cole Weston had been taught how to print his father's negatives. And at that stage, I'd been doing a lot of printing. You know, at the, uh, I was a photographer at the um, National Museum then, and had worked as a mural printer, with printing John John's work and so on. So I could see, oh, Weston would be the kind of peak. So of all the pictures I chose, this one which had been published in Creative Camera magazine and also in, I think in the day books, um, I decided this is one I want, wanted because it was the most, it was sort of typical in terms of technique, but difficult in terms of subject matter because even Beaumont Newhall, uh, the great US uh, art historian, the Pittsburgh historian, he didn't really understand this picture, and you know, and Weston was making a joke, basically. He was being satirical. It was part of a series of satirical photographs he did during the war. It's called um, Civilian Defence, 1942. So I decided that was the print I was going to get from Cole. And in those days, you couldn't just, you know, email them or you know email. You couldn't just contact them and give them money. You had to get a, a license from the government to get US dollars. And I forget, I can't remember if it was $50 or $100. I think it was about $50 at the time, which was a lot, you know, in 69. So anyway, this was the very first foreign photograph that I purchased. And uh, I don't really consider myself a collector, but I have, I'm a hoarder, you know, <laughs> I have collected a lot of stuff. And uh, because this was so unusual in the New Zealand context, Practically nobody, <clears throat> maybe John, John John's would be one, maybe one or two other um, commercial photographers like maybe Clifton Firth, people like that. They were, ma <clears throat> were making, oh, and um, uh, Frank Hoffman, for instance, they were making high quality, large format work often, but generally speaking, the contemporary photographers had not really been using large format cameras. And so <clears throat> I, I showed this, well, I showed it to everybody who was interested, and that was a lot of people at that stage. And so this kind of helped encourage people like um, Lawrence Everhart, um, John John, John Fields had already, was already using a large format camera when he was in the States, but he, but he went back and got, got, bought his camera over and started photographing with large format here. Uh, and uh, it was particularly significant for Ian, for, for Peter Perrier when he saw it. This was the, the, the very print that turned Peter on to photography, which kind of took him over the edge to decide, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. So that's quite exciting. But <clears throat> what happened was, because I was showing it around, it was in a frame, glass frame, one day I came back to my home in Mount Eden and taking the prints, other prints too, in this frame picture out of the car, I tapped it on my knee and cracked, smashed the glass. So being kind of essentially a documentary and diaristic photographer, I took a photograph of the smashed frame with the Wester behind it. And if you look closely, it's, I haven't had it retouched. You've still got little, it's, it's kind of destroys the illusion, but you've got little chips out of the gas mask here and out of her chest and out of here. Be, because, um, <coughs> I followed, a lot, you know, I followed the work and encouraged a lot of photographers as a teacher and editor and so on. Um, I used to know, you know most of the serious photographers of the country. I'm out of touch now. But um, over the years, I have, you know, when you're encouraging someone at, in those days, we all would give each other a print. So I've been donated prints. Sometimes I've bought them. But generally speaking, um, a lot of the work has been gifted, uh, except the Western and a few others. And, uh, but I have, I have uh, made a point of trying to collect 19th century work, you know, really beautiful 
work from the 19th century. So Simon Baubach here at the gallery, he had the good idea of putting on a show of my own work, plus some work from my collection for, for sale. And that's worked really well. And Andrew Clark designed the display, did a terrific job, I think. And anyway, it's a kind of a cross-section of the sort of things that uh, I've, I've kept. And I could talk for hours about <laughs> probably each one. But uh, like, like behind, behind you is a wonderful photograph by Alan MacDonald, um, who I met in Wellington. He was a teenager of the, one of the anti-Vietnam protesters, whose name was St. Scott. John Miller told me who the man was. But for me, what's interesting too is this kind of gentle young guy with long hair and glasses, really feeling, you know, the kind of the moment where everyone's out there protesting and trying to get some kind of social change, get New Zealand out of Vietnam and so on. And it's, it's kind of all encapsulated in that beautiful little picture. Yeah, one, one of my uh, pet themes, uh, because I'm very, very conscious of, like with 19th century work and so on, I'm very conscious of the fragility of the original print, of the vintage print. And what that means is that some of the most important photographs made in the country, and here and elsewhere, um, there's simply, you know, from a collector's point, of, there simply are no vintage prints. So it's not like you, this is what gallerists want, it's what collectors usually want, and so on. So I'm always trying to push the buttons and you know move things on a bit for people accepting that. Look, you've either got a new print; these are actually 30 years old, but you've got you've either got a a copy, a really high quality copy, or you've got a, a modern print from the original negative um, that is the substitute for the vintage print. You, you just have to accept that. I, either that or you simply don't have, you don't have an image to, to look at or publish or purchase or whatever or exhibit. So uh, this, this particular picture of the uh, Tari photograph, I think it was by William Tari, but possibly his brother Fred, is of the, we found out, it's of the Love Family, it's, the title is Love Family. Waikawa Pa, Picton, New Zealand. That's you know, where they were. But when we originally published it as a poster for Photo Forum to help support the finances of the magazine, we published it as the Ba Maori Wedding. You know, it was very gen generic and not very specific. But the point I'd like to make is I discovered that negative, the negative of this picture in the Nelson Mitchell Museum, and, and I could see this is amazing. There's just so much going on, it's so much about New Zealand, uh, you know, with the, um, obviously with the Maori, mainly Maori people, there are a few Pākehā at the wedding there, but we've got, you know, like the, the bridal couple all, all dressed up, and the kids and so on, so, and people, you know, dressed up in suits and whatnot, so you've got the kind of slightly more middle class, maybe well-off people, and then slowly as you go to the edge, you get more of the rallies or maybe the neighbours who, you know, aren't quite part of the inner circle and they sit there outside. Then you've got things like the, the picket fence, which is not completed, so you get half a picket fence. And then you get the rough old fence there as well. And there's washing, I think, on the line. And then you've got the beautiful three gabled building with the, the Maori, I think it's a Maori design of some kind. And then you've got the poplar trees, which were imported by all the foreigners or the Pākehā, and then you've got the typical New Zealand hill in the background. So it's kind of like, to me, it's, a, it's one of the most iconic photographs of New Zealand, it saves so much. And almost to prove that, when I showed it to dozens of people around the world, most of them didn't respond. They didn't think it was important, they didn't think it was very interesting. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, you know, because this is localised, you know, it's about about this country.